The Israeli delegation was scheduled to arrive in Cairo yesterday to participate in ceasefire talks. Humanitarian crisis has worsened on the Gaza Strip, meanwhile, with trouble getting aid to the region in a timely fashion. Now, as a global community sounds the alarm citing humanitarian crisis in the region, we must begin to ask tough questions around the complexity of U.S.-Israel relations, looking at its history and the complexity of the current situation. Now, despite a widening rift between the Biden administration and Benjamin Netanyahu's government, the U.S. did authorize a transfer of bombs and airplanes for Israel. So for further insights, we now connect with Professor Kim Byung-ju of the Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Good morning, Professor Kim. Good morning. Happy Monday and thank you for joining us. Happy Monday to you, too. All right, we're going to take our listeners back just a week. Last week, Monday, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in war ravaged Gaza. Now, having vetoed three times against similar moves before, the U.S. abstained at this time, allowing the measure to pass. So, of course, questions like what motivated such a shift comes into question. Do we see an important shift in the U.S. stance towards Israel? What we see basically is kind of the world divided between one group, uh, two groups. One is Israel and United States together on this issue of uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, Hamas conflict. Uh, on the other hand, the rest of the world opposing the way Israel and uh, and the United States are handling the situation here. So, in in this big picture of division between Israel, U.S. together, and then rest of the world against it. The United States kind of like uh, ran out of, uh, you know, uh, you know what they could bear with uh, mm. this time. And so after three, as you mentioned, after three um, vetoing three times mm-hmm. against the United Nations Security Council resolution, this time they abstained from it. And uh, as a result of it, uh, the Netanyahu government was mm. infuriated mm. and uh, they really showed their anger. Uh, through many different uh, forms of uh, reaction, one that stood out was, uh, you know, this this uh, southern city of Rafal mm-hmm. uh, within Gaza Strip, uh, where more than one million people had lived, and now the, with refugees, we don't you exactly know how many people are there. Uh, you know, Israel is talking about attacking, invading Ra- the city of Rafal, and the United States has been standing against it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were going to talk about how Israel, what what kind of Israel, uh, what kind of plan Israel has in terms of invading Rafal, while the United States was trying to dissuade from this attack. And they were going to have a meeting, but but as a result of this uh, UNSCR uh, issuing and the United oh. States staying away from it, then me- then meeting fell apart. Right, and right. Uh, you know Netanyahu came out saying we're not going to send our delegation to Washington to explain what we are going to do with. The city of Rafal, and right. we're going to do whatever we is necessary, and that that uh, together with his other words of uh, expression of anger, really uh, you know exploded. And even with inside Israel, there were criticisms raised against in Netanyahu's expression of anger, saying he's going too far. He's actually damaging our precious relationship with the United States. Mm. That's what many of the Israeli um, uh, media was saying, but. Mm. But point being here that, you know, uh, this UNSCR action or inaction on the side of the United States uh, uh, provided a uh, kind of trigger point for a kind of explosion of the disagreements and angers toward each other mm. regarding the the Gaza Strip issue between Israel and the United States. And what's even more interesting is that Trump even came out criticizing mm. both sides. That mm. Trump is a figure you would not believe that he would act uh, or say anything against Israel. Right. You know, among many things that he has done for pro-Israel, uh, he has son-in-law, uh, Kushner, right. is a Jewish American, and, and they've been working very hard, you know, to, you know, strengthen Israel-U.S. ties. He has his family element in it here, but he was this time saying, uh, you know, uh, the Israel has to end the war here. Trump was saying, mm. and you know this uh, this war is not uh, gaining any support from around the world, and Israel has to stop this war. And 
uh, or to Biden government, uh, Trump was saying, this all happened because of Biden. Biden mishandled the situation. Uh, but of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then the attack itself, he said, uh -huh. you know, October 7 attack itself ha happened because of Biden. I, we don't know exactly what the logic is, but, uh. but uh, all the responsibility falls on the shoulder of Biden, you would say. <laughs> no surprise there. But uh, anyway, so mm -hmm. great disagreement between Israel and the United States, and uh, we are seeing this here. Uh, as a result of the world being divided between the two groups, Israel, United States together, as I mentioned, and the rest of the wor world opening on the other side. Uh, and maybe we'll get to the history of maybe Democrats, uh, not just flip-flopping, but, you know, readjusting uh, their stance on the Gaza Strip uh, battles, uh, wars before. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's too simplified to say that a single entity, a single country can be responsible for all of it. And certainly right, not right. just the Biden <laughs> administration. Right, right. But, but I've got to say, I mean, be, with the important election coming up in November, in the United States, that's not really a surprising stance to take. Um, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Now, despite the recent disagreements between Israel uh, and the United States, would it be fair to say that the U.S. support for Israel ever since the Hamas attack last October has sufficiently demonstrated a special nature of U.S.-Israeli ties backed by the bipartisan support in Washington? Uh, I, I also saw a recent report saying now that despite the widening rift between Biden administration and Benjamin Netanyahu's government, the U.S. also authorized a trans for bombs and airplanes. Right, exactly. That's a really important point. And, you know, uh, over the recent years, before the October 7th attack, we were kind of being reminded of the difference between Democrats and Republicans, which we will talk about. But uh, overall, this time, as a result of this uh, October 7th attack, we are reminded once again, the United States as a whole is strongly pro-Israel. I and mean, perhaps the only pro-Israel, significant pro-Israel pro force among the major powers in the world here. Uh, and uh, what happened was, uh, we remember ten day, only ten days after the attack, Biden himself flew to Israel, mm -hmm. actually, and uh, demonstrating United States strong support uh, for Israel as a whole. That was a very strong uh, signal of, uh, you know, expression of support altogether. And all along, uh, for many years in this program too, I think we have been talking about the presence of Israel in U.S. politics, and mm -hmm. one that signified, among many things, APEC, AIPAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee. You know, in the United States, there are organizations called PAC, uh, Pol Political Action Committee, and this AIPAC, APEC, is the largest, most powerful uh, PAC in, the, in U.S. politics, which means mm -hmm. So much of money actually flows through AI, uh, APAC, mm. AIPAC, into the pockets of U.S. politicians. Uh, this pro-Israel money uh, flows mm. from the you know the, the Jewish Americans to U.S. politicians and mm. uh, sitting presidents actually in the past so far have spoken at a a APAC conferences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, not only former president, but sitting presidents used to call to a APEC and they would give a speech. This is the single most powerful political organization in U.S. politics. So as a result of it, for example, um, you know, establishment, those elites on the top, red, whether we're talking about Democrats or Republicans, together, all together, you know, they, they are pro-Israel big time. And I think we talked about this, uh, you know, quite a while ago, but uh, for example, 2008, there was a famous book published by leading, actually Jewish American scholars, um, you know, uh, uh, Professor John Mersheimer of Chicago University and uh, Stephen uh, Walt of uh, um, Harvard University. These two Jewish Americans published a book called Israel Lobby and the U.S. Foreign Policy, criticizing the Israel's influence uh, on U.S. foreign policy, mm -hmm. arguing that actually Israel lobby hurts U.S. national interest. Israel lobby is so powerful, it goes against even U.S. national interest. It was quite interesting to see these kind of words coming from, mm -hmm. you know, in you know, the Jewish American uh, scholars criticizing the power of uh, Israel lobby in U.S. politics. It became a huge deal. As a result of it, you know, we saw some changes in the way 
uh, opinion was leaning towards and everything among the elites for a while but then again it's all back to what it used to be among the elites establishment and talking about grassroots or just common citizens especially you know trump supporters in the south in the united states for example the evangelists uh the faith-based organizations and stuff mm -hmm. no question about it it's just absolute support for israel so uh we see both elites and the grassroots public um, you know they have strong basis for supporting israel so you know states as a whole shows this unique stance that's very unique in in, in the world politics that shows strongly pro israel stance mm. maybe we need to take our listeners back in time just a little bit for example during his presidency uh former president barack obama often backed israel's right to self-defense at the start of conflicts with hamas but later called for israeli restrained once there were too many palestinian lives lost i wonder what do we need to be mindful of uh the, in, in the in the fact that democrats have a noted record of disagreement with israel particularly during obama's tenure yeah, uh, you know, having talked about the United States as a whole, strongly pro-Israel entity, and now it's really important to be reminded the division inside it, mm -hmm. inside of it in the U.S., particularly during Obama's time. We talked about this in this program before, but Obama's time was the time when the United States government was uh, trying to implement what's called the offshore balancing uh, and people to Asia, you know, like trying to move away uh, Middle East and let's focus on Asia. That was the stance. And what? Do we, how do we move away from uh, the Middle East? The key Middle Eastern allies, Saudi Arabia, Israel, uh, trying to work things out among them and then let them sort out things. And at the same time, we, the United States, is, is going to work out our deals with I Iran. So as a result of it, we remember like the JCPOA Joint uh, Action Plan Agreement uh, on how Iran is going to deal with their nuclear weapons program issues, an agreement signed by uh, P5, permanent five members of uh, UN Security Council plus Germany and EU. Uh, that was announced 2015. So basically, the United States trying to improve relationship with Iran while they're moving slightly away from their key allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel, and letting them work out their relationship together. And that faced a strong, unbelievably strong uh, opposition from then, again, Netanyahu. Netanyahu was prime minister then, mm -hmm. um, you know, 2015. And Netanyahu actually flew to, to uh, Washington mm -hmm. And he would give a speech to Republican controlled US Congress, you know, expressing strong criticism against Obama and uh, all these things that being worked out between the United States and Iran, JCPOA, and he was bombasting uh, Obama government altogether. And it was something that we haven't seen. Uh, we have never seen in the past foreign mm. leader coming to Washington, criticizing uh, you know, White House and giving all these speeches, you know, flying all this criticism against the White House from the Capitol Hill, uh, you know, using this, you know, uh, partisan politics, taking side with Republicans. So it was a real scene. And Biden, having been a vice, uh, the, you know, vice president of Obama government, we were expecting certain kind of uh, tendency remaining mm, uh, mm, mm. and kind of a seed of tension, if you will, right, between uh, Biden government and uh, Netanyahu government. But but when this thing broke out, uh, October 7th attack broke out, as we mentioned, Biden uh, had shown strong support. But since then, of course, the world is turning against Israel, humanitarian crisis, unbelievable you know, the atrocities and stuff. And uh, so Biden government is caught in between the world uh, community's opinion on one hand and then having to still support Israel because mm. this is American government. So it's very complicated situation. But we remember this, all these troubles back in Obama's time. Uh, not to add to the complexity, but I think we absolutely have to touch upon this. Israel's domestic politics also adds to complexity of the situation. Can we talk a little bit about the political dynamics that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu faces? This is, uh, people kind of, looks like we, many of us might have largely, whether we like it or not, kind of forgot about what was happening before October 7th last year, right? I mean, with regard to Israel. Before Hamas attack, Remember, it's hard to recall now after all these things that's happening since October 7th, mm -hmm. but we know before Hamas action, we were 
hearing continuously about this protest mm -hmm. on the streets of Israel against Netanyahu, protest, mm -hmm. protest against yes. what? Protest against Netanyahu's uh, efforts uh, go against uh, his judiciary. Right. Uh, Netanyahu government right now is an is a you know it's not his party. Uh, the good party only, but it's a form of it's a an, it has different parties participating in this government, and there are strong elements of extremely conservative uh, political parties, uh, you know, Orthodox Jews and so on, uh, participating in this coalition government there. And this Netanyahu government, what they have tried is try to kind of limit, and restrict uh, the Supreme Court power of Supreme Court and the power of. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 what do you call it, a prosecutor general, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, Israel has had a very powerful, uh, you know, Supreme Court and prosecutor general that could actually act against uh, executive government if executive government in, introduced certain uh, regulations. And then even legislature, if legislature introduced certain legislations, they could say, oh, this is unconstitutional, you cannot implement it, they could slap, stop it. And what Netanyahu has been trying before Hamas attack was trying to change their constitution, their mm -hmm. their laws, you know, to limit the power of uh, judiciary. What made this one very controversial is the fact that actually Netanyahu is still on trial. He was right. accused of uh, corruption right. and several wrongdoings, right, back right. in 2019. And he has been on trial and he still ran for election and then he came back as the prime minister and since he came back he's trying all these things against judiciary that has been trying him on the court mm -hmm. so there have been strong strong uh reactions and uh, you know the protest against so what we know is this hamas attack actually strengthened the political position for mm. Uh, Netanyahu because mm. he faced this division challenges, but now country had to be united mm. uh, facing this attack. But now uh, with this hostage issues, Israeli people are very angry right, uh, about right. Netanyahu's aggression, kind of further delaying the return of hostages. We we were told over this church just past weekend, thousands of thousands of them were protesting at the parliament and right. also streets of Israel criticizing Netanyahu, asking for his resignation, right. asking for a general election and everything. So what we see basically is all this political cha challenge that Netanyahu faces. And as he faces the challenges, Netanyahu is likely to act more aggressive, mm. you know, aggressive against uh, Palestinians and then aggressive against the United States, aggressive against Biden government. So, so th this is not good. I mean, you know, I could, uh, Israeli people want political change and as a result of it, domestic political agenda and interest for Netanyahu is leading him towards more and further and further of these confrontational directions. That's this is really not good. And this is while the global community, uh, maybe besides Israel and the United States, or maybe partially, be some Americans have voiced their concerns with the increased humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they're hoping for mm -hmm. peace in Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. What do we see ahead, Professor Kim? Altogether, I think this Israel problem, if you will, uh -huh. as a problem of world community, is one of the critical elements of bigger issue, bigger problem we would call the decline of the United States, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The United States is facing this problem of de having to deal with the Ukraine situation, mm -hmm. uh, where they cannot just sit there and then watch Ukraine being defeated by Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. Uh, when there is a different uh, now opinion in Europe about uh, you know how the world should continue to support Ukraine or not, and then inside the United States, so mm. Ukraine is a huge headache, and then Taiwan situation is a huge headache going forward. Mm. Uh, this is uh, a lot of people recognize Taiwan as a part of uh, territory of China, but the, there is a big you know, equal number of people saying this has to remain an independent state mm. uh, upholding the principle of democracy and human rights. And so, you know, China's intervention in Taiwan is it cannot be tolerated. But how is United States is going to actually block it is a big question. So Ukraine, Taiwan and now Israel here, by having to take stance with Israel, United States is, is it's weakening its position by itself. It's kind of shooting itself in the foot mm -hmm. and there's no other choice because mm -hmm. of these people living in the United States, Jewish Americans and all that kind of stuff. So 
uh, Israel question, together with Ukraine and Taiwan, are all adding to the problem of U.S. decline. And what's the problem? What's wrong with U.S. decline? Well, for Korea, one as a country that has achieved this modernization and development uh, based on the support from U.S.-led Western world. Mm. It's a problem for us and, uh, you know, like how we stand and position ourselves in this turmoil is a huge question. And it's a problem that Europeans, Western Europeans also face as well. But this is a mm. big issue, a challenge for all of us. And it's a reminder that Israel issue is a reminder that this is common global challenge that we have to sort through, whether we like it or not. Thank you so much, Professor Kim, for your insights. We appreciate it as always. Thank you. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.